Some of the most significant and tangible contributions that turn-of-the-century European immigrants provided the world were in the field of entertainment. And the Lower East Side has spawned some of the most accomplished film producers, directors, actors, and composers in the medium's century-long history. In fact, without the influence of these early immigrants and their offspring, the motion picture industry as we know it would be very different today. Some of the Edison Company's earliest stereoscopic films include several shorts depicting life in the slums of the Lower East Side. Though the neighborhood did not get its first movie house until about 1906, these films were shown at venues across the nation. In what can be chalked up to the earliest examples of reality TV, these two to three minute, one camera shorts were essentially produced for middle and upper class audiences, who for the first time were able to catch a glimpse of how the other half lives in the new urban ghettos of America. Portrayals of immigrants were largely unfavorable, often inspiring curiosity and amusement in captive audiences. It wasn't until the 1920s that immigrants were depicted sympathetically on the big screen. It was the sons and daughters of the Lower East Side slums who, through the medium of film, helped change the public's perception of the immigrant experience, at the same time altering the direction of the entire entertainment industry. American Vaudeville, which was refined at Tony Pastor's Opera House on the Bowery in the 1870s, was a primary influence in the development of early film and radio. By the time that the iconic Vaudeville hook was introduced at Miner's Bowery Theater in 1902, Jewish, Italian, and other immigrants had infused their brand of song, dance, and comedy, which made the format so successful on the big screen. Another major influence on Hollywood was Yiddish theater, brought to America from Eastern Europe in 1884 and incubated in the tenement district of the Lower East Side. So much so that Second Avenue between Houston and 14th Streets became known as Yiddish Rialto and was highly regarded as a cradle for fine dramatic theater in this city. It's the safest thing for me to do. Mr. Olson, would you play something for Eddie? Do that, will you? Many of America's earliest film and radio stars graduated from these vaudeville and immigrant theater stages. But more than that, the culture bred some of the film industry's original power brokers and innovators of the modern movie-going experience. Nineteen-twenties humoresque. The story of a Lower East Side boy from a poor Jewish family who becomes a successful violinist and brings fortune to the family is often credited as being one of the first to promote a pro-immigrant sentiment. The film was produced by Hungarian-born, Lower East Side raised Adolf Zucker and partially financed by William Randolph Hearst. By 1903, Zucker, an upholstery shop apprentice turned successful furrier, took a gamble and invested in the first motion picture theater chain in America headed by two brothers from Buffalo named Mitchell and Mo Mark. By 1912, Zucker launched his own film distribution company, which ever since a 1927 merger has been known as Paramount Pictures. The Mark brothers had another investor in their blooming theater business, Lower East Side born and raised Marcus Lowe, a man who dropped out of school at an early age to help support his family and went on to establish Lowe's Theatre and co-found Metro Goldwyn Mayer Studios. Some of Lowe's earliest associates and partners were fellow Lower East Siders and future industry moguls like Joseph Schenck and Nicholas Schenck, who founded 20th Century Pictures. William Fox, who founded the Fox Film Corporation. In 1935, these studios merged and created 20th Century Fox. It was men like Lowe, Fox, and the Schenck brothers who brought the motion picture industry to the masses by constructing dozens of theaters in working class neighborhoods throughout the United States. 
With the influence of these early pioneers, a series of films were released in the 1920s focusing on the immigrant experience, and the Lower East Side took center stage. It was an era where many first-generation Americans began rebelling against their ancestry, and the films almost always featured themes of generational friction, overcoming poverty, or struggling to find an identity in America. By this time, the bulk of the movie industry had relocated to the cavernous studios of Hollywood, and much of the streetscape was reproduced on the soundstage. Regardless, success was overwhelming, and working-class audiences flocked to the theaters. In 1927, the first full-length talkie was introduced to the general public, The Jazz Singer, written by Samson Raffelson and starring Al Jolson, both Lower East Side raised. It was the first film to hit theaters accompanied by a synchronized dialogue. The story of a local singer caught between dreams of stardom and his family's traditional Jewish values crossed over class boundaries and proved to be a commercial success. Say, what do you mean I didn't touch the <laughs> Who says I didn't touch going? I said you didn't. Well, I'm going to touch it now, then. By the 1930s, several film productions went on to capitalize on the newfound popularity of the district, like 1931's Sidewalks of New York. Here, Buster Keaton, in one of his earliest talky film roles, plays a bumbling Lower East Side slumlord who falls in love with a poor tenement girl. While pursuing his love interest, Keaton gets caught up in a band of local street toughs and ends up mixing it up with a small-time hood. This portrayal of the rough-and-tumble East Side became a recurring theme in countless productions during cinema's most formative years, which coincided with the nation's waning support of a decade-long ban on alcohol and a severe economic depression, giving rise to a character that would become an icon of the big screen, the American Gangster. Dozens of gangster movies were produced during the 1930s, and the tenement districts of New York City bred three of the most famous tough guy actors of the era, including George Raft, the Hell's Kitchen raised matinee powerhouse, and the Lower East Side's own James Cagney and Edward G. Robinson. Robinson's on-screen persona went on to define the Hollywood gangster, a character which was parodied for generations. Yeah, she's through. She's out of the way. That's what she is. You're lying. You wouldn't dare. I wouldn't, would I? I'll show you. Though he never completely shook the tough guy image, Robinson's career spanned seven decades, earning him an honorary Oscar in 1973. Academy Award winning actor James Cagney, whose breakout role as gangster Tom Powers in 1931's The Public Enemy, led to a series of films which showcased his hard-nosed upbringing. Why, you... By the 1940s, rebelling against the system was out and American patriotism was in. Cagney, an accomplished singer and dancer, broke gangster typecasting and was hired to play the lead in the 1942 blockbuster Yankee Doodle Dandy, where his portrayal of Broadway impresario George M. Cohen earned him an Academy Award for Best Actor. I've got a Yankee Doodle sweetheart. She's my Yankee Doodle joy. A series of popular comedic films released between the late 1930s and 1950s further exploited the Lower East Side's gritty reputation. Little Tough Guys, Dead End Kids, and The Bowery Boys followed the comical adventures of a group of local street kids and inspired several knockoffs. No presentation about the history of motion pictures should fail to mention Stella Adler, one of the most accomplished acting teachers of all time. Born on the Lower East Side in 1901 to Yiddish theater star Jacob Adler, Stella opened the Stella Adler Studio of Acting in 1949 and trained dozens of future movie stars such as Judy Garland, Marlon Brando, and Robert De Niro. Hi. 
Miss Monroe worked in my classes, by the way, in the regular classes, and she also worked at the actor's studio. Perhaps the only person to give Stella Adler a run for her money was father of method acting, Lee Strasberg, whose family immigrated to Lower East Side from the Ukraine in 1909. Strasberg, alumni of the former Christie Street Settlement Houses Drama Club, trained the likes of James Dean, Dustin Hoffman, Marilyn Monroe, and Al Pacino, and was director of the prestigious actor's studio from 1951 until his passing in 1982. Like show business, like no business I know. And what would the movie going experience be without a film score? Some of the most respected composers and lyricists hail from the Lower East Side. Eight time Academy Award nominated composer Irving Berlin, who penned such classics as Putting on the Ritz, White Christmas, and There's No Business Like Show Business, started out as a singing waiter in the most raucous Bowery dives. George Gershwin, who got his first piano while growing up on 2nd Avenue, is often remembered as a stage composer. However, he provided the score to a handful of films before his untimely passing, including the song They Can't Take That Away From Me, which earned an Oscar nomination for the best song in 1937. Sharing that nomination was George's brother and writing partner, Ira Gershwin, who is considered one of the greatest songwriters of the 20th century. Former PS63 student Yip Harburg has transported millions of people somewhere over the rainbow as lyricist for one of the most successful and beloved motion pictures of all time, The Wizard of Oz. Though not officially credited, Harburg played a larger role behind the scenes of the movie. He acted as script supervisor, helped with casting, and wrote in several classic scenes. Other pioneering Lower East Side to Hollywood transplants include Eddie Cantor, Jimmy Durante, George Burns, John Garfield, Tony Curtis, Stel Getty, Walter Matthau, Zero Mostel, Jerry Stiller, and dozens more. Looking at the happy sweethearts while they sit around and spoon. There's two lonesome people in the whole wide world. That's me and the man in the moon.